Its premise was based on a book published in 1812 that ran for three seasons in the 60s, came back as a big budget movie and has a reboot series on a streaming service. No, it's not Star Trek. It was about a crew of space explorers far from home. No, not that one. Or them. Or them. Give up? Okay, it's lost in space. Lost in Space features some classic characters such as Maureen Robinson, Professor Robinson, Don West, Judy Robinson, Penny Robinson, Will Robinson, Dr. Smith, and the robot. Lost in Space is about the adventures of a crew on board the Jupiter 2, which gets knocked off course from its original mission to Alpha Centauri. Professor John Robinson, played by former TV Zorro guy Williams, sorry, that should be TV Zorro, comma, Guy Williams, comma, head of the family and leader of the Jupiter 2 mission. He's your typically sensible leaning man and father figure, assuming your father is an astrophysicist astronaut with a ray gun. He's also one of those cool dads who lets his daughter's boyfriend accompany the family on vacations, provided the door stays open three inches. There's nothing to discuss. The Jupiter 2's destination is Alpha Centauri. End of discussion. Indeed. Every son wants to feel that his father's the greatest, that he can succeed in anything. And you can too. No. No, son, I can't. His wife, Dr. Maureen Robinson, is a biochemist, which in the mid-1960s must have been code for someone who makes dinner and does laundry, since that's pretty much what Maureen does when she's not being an understanding mother. June Lockhart had previously played more or less the same role on the Lassie TV series for several seasons, so there's an agent who's really trying hard for their client. Now, do you intend to destroy the only means we have of getting back where we belong? Even I can't talk to him. He just walks away. The pilot of the Jupiter 2 is Major Don West, played by Mark Goddard. Don is loyal to the Robinsons, but is also easily provoked by their unwanted stowaway, and would spend the next three years threatening to punch him in the face. You're way out of line. You're twisting the facts. I would have gone. He's also got something cooking with the eldest Robinson daughter, Judy, played by Marta Kristen. I've watched all three seasons of the show, and I'm still trying to find something to say about Judy, who doesn't so much as have lines in episodes, more usually a line at best. Well when they allow her dialogue, Judy is generally compassionate and understanding. I'm sure I followed the assembly procedure properly. Well, if you did, what's his solar battery doing out here? The Robertson's middle child is Penny, who at the start of the series is about 11 and looks about 34 by the end of season 3. Penny is the most sensitive Robinson, unless we're talking about her dick of a brother, Will. Penny has a pet bloop, which is a chimp that wears a furry hat. Just like the kids hanging outside my house. It's a school night, so what are they doing? I might have to call the cops. Anyway, the bloop is so named because it makes a bloop sound that comes from a middle-aged man with no self-respect making bloop bloop sounds off camera. I, I know how I'd feel if I thought I was going home and suddenly discovered I wasn't. The youngest Robinson is Will. Unlike his sisters, Will manages to snaffle all the plot lines and screen time from the rest of the family. It helps that Bill Moomy was an excellent actor and makes what could have been an intensely irritating character quite watchable. Possibly the only time the child the genius character was ever likeable and not irritating. Again, unlike his sisters, Will gets to participate in the plots more often and has formed a bond with Dr. Smith that is both touching and creepy at the same time, but mostly creepy because of the touching. Why couldn't Dr. Smith have waited? Why did he have to be so curious? Why couldn't he have just... Do you wish me to prepare a six-foot trench for Dr. Smith while we are waiting to communicate with Professor Robinson? Will Robinson has red hair. John and Penny have dark hair. Maureen and Judy are blonde. That's just an observation. I'm not casting any aspersions as to the true identity of Will Robinson's father. I mean, it says John Robinson on his birth certificate. There was that time that John and Maureen took separate holidays and she went to Mardi Gras with her BFF a few months before Will's birth and came back with a bag stuffed full of beaded necklaces. But I digress. Let's just push on. Warning, warning. It does not compute. Okay, so then we come to Dr. Zachary Smith. Added to the series after the original pilot, Colonel Zachary Smith, as he was first known, is very different from the popular image of Dr. Smith. First off, he's a sneering agent of a foreign power who was attempting to sabotage the Jupiter 2, but somehow got caught on board when it took off. In early episodes, Smith is actively trying to kill the Robinsons, often getting caught out and making sneering denials that for some reason managed to assuage everyone's suspicions. Except Don. Don seems ready to eject Dr. Smith from the nearest airlock. Not that it would have done much good, since they were already marooned on a planet, so at best Smith would have gotten a face full of sand. But I guess it helps Don get over his homicidal tendencies. Since the others serve no purpose, they must be liquidated. Destroy everyone! Smith quickly morphs into a simpering, greedy, lazy coward, merely there to drive the plots and make things worse. 
As Smith became more popular, the show pivoted away from the other adult actors, and Jonathan Harris became the undisputed star of the series. Never fear, Smith is here. He's billed as a special guest star, last in the credits, simply because he was added to the series last, and then the unusual credit is there to assuage Harris's concerns and his massive ego. You're probably thinking, what kind of man would use a parent's love for his own preservation? Now, uh, William, let's go in. You first and turn on the lights. Danger! Danger! Lastly, there's the robot. Robot is initially under the control of Dr. Smith, but as Smith becomes more of a coward, the robot becomes more cynical and learns to troll Smith. You ran the last 300 yards in three minutes. A record for snails. I came to love the robot the most by the end of the series. You are responsible for all the mistakes. Hold your tongue, you bubble-headed booby. Inside the robot was Bob May, giving life to an inanimate object, with voiceover man Dick Tufeld already providing the narration at the start and end of each episode, providing the robot's voice. That voice is so iconic that Tufeld returned for many of the various reboots and attempted reboots decades later. I think that is very funny. <laughs> Silence, you sniggering cinderbox! The relationship between Will and the robot was akin to a boy and his dog. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger! Both are loyal to each other, and one would do anything to protect the other. When unessential personnel are found alone, destroy... The popular tale, Swiss Family Robinson by 19th century Swiss author Johann David Weiss had already been adapted into films and TV several times by the mid-1960s, and there was even a comic called Space Family Robinson. Would you like some coffee? Producer and director Erwin Allen, fresh off the success of his TV version of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, pitched and sold his own science fiction version of Swiss Family Robinson to the US ABC network. Eventually titled Lost in Space in order to stave off legal issues with the Space Family Robertson comic, a pilot episode was commissioned. The original Lost in Space pilot, No Place to Hide, is interesting in that it is very different from the series that would follow. The ship is called the Gemini 2, and the Robinsons' mission is slated to last for more than 90 years, but Penny's boyfriend said he would totally wait for her. While the main cast is essentially the same, there is no Dr. Smith and no robot. Let that sink in. It is almost impossible for us to conceive of either character not being part of the series. Nobody quotes Judy Robinson or Don. They quote Dr. Smith and the robot. The original pilot and some of the early episodes was more of a traditional survival story closer to its source material than the whimsical mishmash we got later on. A lot of the effect sequences for the pilot were shot in colour despite the fact the show was slated to be made in black and white. This was handy since some of those nice effect shots were recycled multiple times throughout the series to come. Owen Allen was known as someone who recycled a lot of props, sets, costumes, storylines, etc., yet never won any awards as an environmentalist. Unlike Star Trek, which arrived on TV almost fully formed with tweaks here and there, Lost in Space did change quite a lot over the course of three seasons. The first season, premiering in 1965 and made in black and white, sees the Jupiter 2 crash land on a planet and we see the crew attempt to make repairs, replenish their stocks along with a little light exploration of their unintended home. This being a show aimed at kids and family audiences, the planet is named Propolanus, which is also the name of the medical condition you can get while watching 80 plus episodes of Lost in Space in such a short time. Of course, while the Jupiter 2 has its own SUV, the Chariot, much of the action seems to take place within walking distance of the Jupiter 2. If there's a cave or an alien city, or monsters, Pokemon Go gym or alien landing sites, it's probably, at best, a 10 minute walk from the Jupiter 2 crash site. So this isn't Star Trek or Twilight Zone or The Outer Limits, any attempt to do literate sci-fi for adults. Lost in Space is often aimed at kids, or at least what the writers thought kids would like. I'm way out, man, like the rest of you cats. Because, you know, what kid doesn't want to hang out with a middle-aged bachelor like Dr. Smith, it seems? If Lost in Space had made in the 1980s, would there have been a very special episode of Lost in Space? I wish you'd go away. You've been acting very strange lately, Dr. Smith. Very soon it became apparent that having Smith actively trying to kill the Robinsons wasn't going to be sustainable, and the actor Jonathan Harris slowly turned it down by playing Smith as a buffoon and comedic villain. The network looked at this series that they ran during family hour and decided they didn't want a maniac hanging out with the kids. But then they also didn't want the married parents even touching each other, and so the show morphed into a more whimsical science fantasy, almost a pantomime than sci-fi adventure. There are times where it's intimated that Robinsons know that Smith has some mental issues, and leave it at that. The other thing that influenced the direction of the series was a show that debuted opposite Lost in Space midway through its first season. 
Batman premiered in January 1966 and became an instant pop culture phenomenon, one that dented the ratings for the first half hour of Lost in Space. Irwin Allen, not noted as a man with a sense of humour, figured the best way to combat Batman was to completely mimic its sense of camp. Warning! Warning! Lost in Space starts off with the Robinsons as space pioneers, yet after just a handful of episodes, it's clear there are travellers from Earth all over the shop, yet almost none of them are able to help the Robinsons get back to Earth. What's more, the people they encounter all somehow seem to be space travellers from the 18th and 19th century. A magical items simply appear so they can get straight to the plot, which more often than not sees Smith get excited about getting home, or greed, or power, and then attempts to screw over everyone else in order to get what he wants. Just like our engineer Frank, who's a very fussy eater, and even though he has three children with severe peanut allergies, only serves pad thai and peanut butter sandwiches for Thanksgiving. Oh, cool it, man. Will's a big boy now, and I'm a big girl. So why don't you just go back with the rest of the olders and leave us to do our thing? By the show's second season, now in garish full colour, looking like a clown spontaneously combusted in a paint factory, it had basically become a full-on comedy series chronicling Will Smith and the robot. Look, let me rephrase that. Will, comma, Smith, comma, and the robot. See, folks, punctuation is important. The diminishing roles of the other cast members didn't go unnoticed, and there was sort of a passive-aggressive pushback from some of the cast members, which just led to more of Will, Dr. Smith, and the robot. It's a vicious circle, particularly when Alan wasn't interested in letting any of his barely used cast members out of their contracts. Would you like a little more coffee, Don? Hmm? Oh, no, thanks. As a modern viewer, too much Smith is like going to the M&M store and filling your backpack with M&Ms. While the smell of fake chocolate makes you think you want a backpack full of M&Ms, your stomach lining will protest when you get halfway down. Would you like some coffee? Lost in Space found a much better balance in its third season, giving a lot more for John and Don and Penny to do and paring back ever so slightly on the amount of Dr. Smith. There was still hardly any use for Maureen and Judy and indeed, June Lockhart seems to be missing entirely from many episodes towards the end of the series. The show had tilted so much towards Smith and the robot that you didn't notice. Now all of this is a shame because while Harris and Mumi are great, when they do give the other actors something to do, they are always great and those tend to be the better episodes. Perhaps because the actors were good? or perhaps because they were just hungry. Watching Lost in Space is like going to a restaurant that you visit often and ordering the same thing all the time. Every now and then you say, oh, I'll try something else on the menu and discover that it's, oh, this is actually quite tasty. Some of the better episodes feature those other actors in more substantive roles. There are a few corkers where they put two characters most antagonistic towards each other, Smith and Don West, together in an episode. And indeed, there was for a time a suggestion to write out John Robinson and Maureen from the fourth season, since their characters become so superfluous that the actors were barely used. While the Jupiter 2, Chariot and Robot all have interesting design, pretty much every other spacecraft, alien and robot that appeared throughout the series was either recycled from another Allen production, or laughably bad, or in many cases, both. Lost in Space has its own kind of verisimilitude. That is, it's a load of complete bollocks. 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 The thing about enjoying Lost in Space is, it often has no rhyme or reason or any appreciable logic. You're really just watching for the character interaction. It's almost like watching a vaudeville show or a sketch comedy. It's hard to take a show seriously that it has people popping in and out of thin air, dressed like Vikings or Arabian Nights or pirates. It's ridiculous. So much so that it's impossible to take seriously. So, don't. It's a kid's space fantasy show. Let it wash over you. It's infectious. Would either one of you care for some more mushrooms? Stories kind of just happen. Plots didn't always resolve. Quite often they didn't. But I don't think anyone really minded. What Lost in Space has is lots of competently made episodes. The vast majority, good or bad, are just based on concepts that never should have made it past the outline stage. The all-time dumbest is the Great Vegetable Rebellion. It's Lost in Space's equivalent to Spock's brain. But despite the stupidity, it's still fun to watch. I'd argue there are plenty worse Trek and Lost in Space episodes than these because those ones are just dull and lack the entertainment value. Lost in Space is often compared to the original Star Trek, but a better comparison would be Lost in Space and the early 1970s filmation Saturday morning Star Trek cartoon. Both are shows designed for kids, though animated Trek still manages to have logical and interesting sci-fi plots that make sense and are enjoyable to older viewers even today. Lost in Space is just goofy fun. 
I really enjoyed the episodes where the other cast members got their moment in the sun. Guy Williams showed why he was meant to be the star in season 1's closing episodes and then again in season 3's Anti-Matter Man, possibly my favourite from the series. Mark Goddard got some great episodes when he was thrust together with his arch enemy Dr. Smith. Penny got a fair few episodes aimed her way, though these do feel aimed at preteen girls or as a middle-aged male writer in the 1960s thought a preteen girl would like. And there were one or two episodes where the Robinson women get all the action. These episodes are good, but they're few and far between. Judy and I will protect you. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> Season 2's Western theme show, where Harris plays both Smith and the cowboy gunman Zeno, is a lot of fun. Hi, Judy, baby. Dr. Smith, I wish you'd stop looking at me like that. I found the best way to enjoy the show was to lock my brain away in a box. I used a box like this that I found on Gumtree. It's marketed as a brain box that viewers of reality TV can store their brain for up to eight Kardashians, two Love Islands, and a couple of real housewives. So a show made in the mid-1960s. Hmm. Like most American shows of the time, there's no mention of any of the social upheaval of the time, or wars, or unlike Trek, there's no attempt to use allegory or metaphor to address anything like that. It's just not that type of show. It's also very, very white. So hoist up the John B. Sails, see how the main sail sets. And very, very sexist. Well, I volunteered to do the masculine chores, you know, like mow the grass, uh, clean out the garage, change a few light bulbs. Since the other male members of this family are absent, I am in command. And prone to lean on stereotypes the few times it features characters from a non-Anglo-Saxon background. It's important custom that amigos must drink together. Nothing majorly offensive, but in no way progressive or edgy. Lost in Space is just one of those shows you have to chalk up as being of its time. Just like polio or the measles. Lost in Space does have not one, but two cracking theme tunes written by some guy called Johnny Williams. One is more whimsical and the other is more adventurous, and it's the latter that appears in both the movie and the Netflix series. I wonder what Johnny Williams did after working for Irwin Allen. You, Dr. Smith, are 100% fat. Lost in Space ended after three seasons and 83 episodes. Oh, the pain. The pain. It was a bit of a surprise to the cast when it ended, since everyone assumed a fourth year was a lock, but moves from the network and the studio to cut the budget incensed Alan so much that he just let the show end, and he'd concentrate on his other shows. So that was it. Lost in Space was one of those many, many shows from the mid-60s that lived on in repeats and syndication and cable TV for years. After Lost in Space, Irwin Allen kept producing television series such as Land of the Giants, but he had his biggest success directing the massive hit films Poseidon Adventure and The Towering Inferno, and for a while was known as The Master of Disaster. Like a lot of fondly remembered shows from the 60s, Lost in Space was ripe for a comeback. It just took a while. There was a one-off attempt at making Lost in Space as an animated series by Hanna-Barbera, but live-action revivals would take longer, due to Irwin Allen not wanting to hand the property over to anybody else. It took until 1998, when upstart studio New Line released its big-budget Lost in Space Noise Fest, a dumb summer blockbuster that wasn't a huge hit but remained relatively popular as a video rental. In 2004, there was another attempt at a series with a pilot made for the CW, and it's basically Lost in Space aimed at people who like Smallville, which for whatever reason was directed by John Woo. Yes, that John Woo. And now it's on Netflix, in a show where Parker Posey is Smith. And yes, they made her someone with a mental illness. Dr. Smith. That's a fun show that's less whimsical, but not really all that much more logical at storytelling. It still managed to be a fun take on the source material. So Lost in Space was a show that was on a fair bit when I was young, but I'd only really watch it if I happened to be flicking through the channels and there it was. I'd never seek it out like a lot of the shows I liked. When I finally sat down to watch the entire series, it was initially a chore. But then it was interesting, and then I was getting involved in the ridiculous situations that often felt like a bunch of non sequitur scenes that had little relation to each other. It's rubbish and amazing at the same time. There's a certain naivety to Lost in Space. The show never sets out to be serious, or even, let's face it, good. It is, however, a lot of silly, goofy fun. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, and be sure to check out some of our other videos. Let me go home, let me go home, well I feel so break up, I want to go home.